This is Juliana Rannick-Cobries and this is part one of my conversation or interview with Stuart Matson, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Tangier. So Stuart, tell me, how come you're here? How you've now moved here permanently from America, from New York? Do tell me. Actually, from Shanghai. Oh, from Shanghai. I was, Ooh. I was in New York and then on and off in Shanghai for 10 years. Right, And then okay. after coming back from Shanghai, uh, I decided to retire. And I've been traveling here f since the 80s. Right. But um, it's always been a dream of mine to move here because I, when I was 14, I grew up in a small college town in Michigan. And I used to go to the college library, sneak in and with a flashlight, hide in the bathroom until they closed the library, and then I would just read books there, and then hide again in the morning when they opened it up. And I read The Sheltering Sky when I was 14 one night. Paul Bowles. Paul Bowles, and I decided I'm gonna live in Tangier. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So, so it's, you're, it's all, you're living your dream. I'm living my dream, definitely. Fantastic, yes. And you, what did you study? So I studied social psychology, so I studied psychology as an undergraduate. Actually, I had a very multidisciplinary undergraduate career, and you were allowed to do that then. You know, I had took a lot of survey courses, so I had a, I think, a good foundational liberal arts education, and then I went into social psychology as a graduate student. But you never worked as a psychologist. Well, in a way, my job as an account planner or a strategic planner used a lot of the psych. I, t I tended to be more psychologically focused than, say, yeah, culturally focused. Well, actually, both of them, I, because I took a lot of, even when I was in graduate school, I took a lot of cor courses. Now they would probably, they didn't have this major at the time, but it was probably more like cultural studies, because I did psychology, sociology, anth cultural anthropology, oh. and... Um, so I really was very interested in studying people as well as cultures. Right. So have you studied the Moroccan people? I'm in the process of doing it now as I live here. And one of the things like, for instance, when I was in China, uh, I kind of do it through osmosis, just by living amongst them, watching them, observing. It's more like observational research. And I just, and of course, then reading, um, like, the history of the land, the history of the people. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of, actually, I think the Arab culture and Moroccan culture is probably more similar to Asian and Chinese culture. Are, are you going to study the language eventually? I don't think so. No. And I didn't when I was in China. I'm not very good with languages. Even French? Even Well, actually, I'm working on French right now. Right, right. But, um, everyone I've, speaks French. Everyone speaks French. But... Yeah, I just, um, I, I get bored with it. I don't like memorization. I tend to be more intuitive in terms of, of learning. So if, if I'm bored with something, I just usually drop it. Well, and, of course. Yeah. And uh, are you into the music? The music of the, mm, uh, not really. of the country? Not no. really. I like, I like electronica and more modern and avant-garde music. And I find the music here too repetitive uh -huh. yeah, and just not interested. I am. Okay. I'm, and I don't like the rhythm of it. I tend to, I think I tend to like a little, something a little bit more, um, yeah, minimal. Okay, okay. Yeah. So tell me about your earlier life in New York. You, you moved to New York, didn't you? So I went to uh, graduate school in Boston, or, or undergraduate in Boston, and then moved to New York for graduate school, and then basically lived there for 25 years. Right, right, right. But, um, so my earliest experience with the, for the first two years I was in college, <clears throat> and, um, but I lived downtown. And... What, Manhattan? In downtown course, Manhattan. Yeah, and uh, so from the get-go was very involved not only... Um, you know, with school, but also involved in the arts. And when I moved there in 79, it was a huge boom in the downtown scene. It, it, the 70s, New York was bankrupt. It was dirty. It was poor. 
and actually even oh, that, are you talking the Bowery area or no, what area was, when you mean downtown well I lived in Tribeca oh, which yes? is and at that time it was very few people were living there the only people who were living there I had a loft and the only people who were living there were artists okay and uh, musicians and writers uh-huh creatives and creatives and it was a very exciting time. It was a very interesting time. The music, I lived right next to the Mud Club. I, w I went out every night of the week uh, dancing and going to clubs uh, because actually, I told you I did a lot How of- How old were you then? So I was 20 at okay. the time. I graduated early and I took a lot of graduate courses when I was an undergraduate. And so when I got to graduate school, I looked at the reading list and said, I've not only have had read all of these books I've written papers on them oh. so I really didn't have to work too hard in graduate <sighs> school and after the first year I realized I really didn't um, my advisor and the professors I was working with at Columbia um, were doing work I wasn't interested in their work and I mean, basically, when you go to graduate school, you latch on to a professor and yeah, yeah. You, you basically- He becomes your, your mentor. He becomes your mentor and you study what they're studying or yeah, carry yeah. on their work. And yeah. I couldn't find anybody that I really related to. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I also decided I really didn't need a PhD because the only reason for getting a PhD is to teach. And I decided, you know, I don't, one, you don't make any money. It's impossible <laughs> to find a job. I mean, right. You're, I mean, you, you usually might as well do something else. And I thought, you know what? I I like mm. nice things. I like beautiful things. I want to make money, and so I can afford to have them. And and also, I was very interested in advertising. Uh, and also interested in a creative career and working in a creative industry. And so, advertising seemed to be a good fit. But my background was really again in social psychology and studying people and culture and so I found this job called strategic planning and um, got into that loved it and, and that became your your career and that became my career <clears throat> and, and, and identity yeah pretty much yeah I mean because it, it was really it so was, how would in a nutshell how would you have described yourself as a strategist or a strategist but it's sort of in a way it was like the most intellectual job I could find that also provided me with uh, the funds to have an exciting life in New York City. And what for you was an exciting life? Oh, I was very involved in the arts and um, I collected art. Um, most of my friends actually were artists. And um, a part of my job in advertising is I worked very closely with the creative team, a copywriter and an art director. and often they tended to be off on their own little world in the agency but they saw me as a creative person so they trusted me right. and we developed good relationships and um, they became mostly my friends and then also visual art a lot of visual artists and i also knew <clears throat> gallerists and the downtown scene at that time the art scene was very intimate very small um, there were only a handful of galleries in Soho, but uh, once you got in... And what about Chelsea? Because that's a Chelsea, big art. Chelsea didn't exist at that oh, time. Right. It only really started... Chelsea Hotel? The, yeah, the Chelsea Hotel, but that was... But the, the Chelsea art world didn't even exist then. It, okay. it really only came into being in like the 90s. Oh, okay. And, and then once the rents in Soho got so expensive, the galleries, basic, a lot of the galleries had bought their buildings yeah. and they realized they could rent them to, you know, Saint Laurent or Chanel or because all of those Midtown or Madison Avenue flagship stores started moving into Soho, they could make more money renting their, their gallery the space. Yeah, and then they also were moving to Chelsea to get bigger spaces too. Okay, we'll, we'll continue that in part two. Thank you very much.